House of the Dragon is an adaptation of Fire and Blood, a prequel to the A Song of Ice and Fire series, detailing the first half of the Targaryen reign, with a big focus on the civil war known as Dance of the Dragons. House of the Dragon adapts precisely this conflict, and since this story is stylized as an in-universe history book where a lot of the events are unclear, the showrunners needed to make certain decisions as to which version of events are they going to show. Whenever fans of the books question some of these decisions, the go-to excuse is always that Fire and Blood is unreliable, and that's why every choice, no matter how irrational or contradictory, is valid and cannot be criticized. That excuse is used even in the situations where the validity of historical claims was not put into question, such as the ages of the characters, their relationships to each other, or the placements of characters in place and time. One of the things that House of the Dragon altered significantly was the characterization of the protagonist of the story, Rhaenyra Targaryen, who is so drastically different from her book counterpart that she seems like an entirely different character. That change did not only make her a worse character, but has wide-spanning implications on the entire narrative. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Combining all the information about Rhaenyra Targaryen given to us in the supplementary material and George R. R. Martin's comments, we get the following picture of her. She had typical Valerian features of purple eyes and silver gold hair, which she wore in a long braid in the manner of Queen Visenya Targaryen. Her uncle Prince Daemon Targaryen declared her the most beautiful maiden in all seven kingdoms. As a child she was precarious, bright and bold, with the court naming her the realm's delight. As an adult, Rhaenyra had a large bosom, and she never lost weight she gained from pregnancies. By the age of 20, after her third pregnancy, she grew stout and thick of waist. Rhaenyra always dressed richly, favoring purple and maroon velvets and golden marriage lace in intricate patterns. Her bodice often glittered with pearls and diamonds, and there were always rings on her fingers. Whenever she was anxious, she would turn them compulsively. Though she could be charming, Rhaenyra was quick to anger and never forgot a slight. As far as the events of the books are concerned, Rhaenyra Targaryen was the only surviving child of King Viserys I Targaryen and Queen Emma Arryn. At age 7, she became a dragon rider, having bonded with a young she-dragon Cyrax. This would make Rhaenyra the youngest known dragon rider in history. At age 8, Rhaenyra already served her father as a cupbearer. It was around that time when her mother died in childbirth without giving the king a male heir, which prompted Viserys to name her as his successor. Viserys then remarried with Alison Hightower. Relations between stepmother and a stepdaughter were amicable at first, but turned sour when the new queen gave birth to three sons, yet Viserys refused to change the succession to favor them. Alison's father Otto, who was also Viserys' hand, pushed the matter so strongly that Viserys removed him from the office. The princess and the queen became bitter rivals, and after the tournament where they wore a black and a green gown respectively, their supporters eventually started referring to themselves as the Blacks and the Greens. At first, Sir Criston Cole, a member of the King's Guard and Rhaenyra's sworn shield, was the most ardent of the Blacks. However, he suddenly changed his allegiance to Queen Alicent, with rumors saying that it was Rhaenyra spurning his advances which prompted this decision. Per some most salacious claims, Rhaenyra's uncle was teaching her how to please a man sexually, all to seduce Sir Criston Cole, with whom Rhaenyra was infatuated with. Considering that Criston becomes Rhaenyra's sworn shield when she's seven and Alison asks who will protect Rhaenyra from Criston, this dynamic is very creepy. Rhaenyra always had her eyes on her uncle Daemon and she supposedly lost her virginity to him, which seems to be the reason why Viserys exiled Daemon. At age 16, Rhaenyra became the ruling princess of Dragonstone, cementing her claim to the throne, as every Targaryen heir received that title. 
Naturally, she had many suitors, but eventually entered an arranged marriage to Sir Lainor Velaryon. Reluctantly agreeing to it when Viserys threatened to remove her as heir, since it was common knowledge that Lainor was gay. Due to a mishap during the wedding tourney and the fact that the newlyweds would spend most of their time apart, some question whether the marriage was even consummated. Meanwhile, Daemon married Lainor's sister Lena. In spite of this, Rhaenyra and Lena were good friends, with a hint that perhaps they were romantically involved as well. Rhaenyra gave birth to three of Lainor's sons, Jaceris, Lucerys and Joffrey, but all three had brown hair and eyes, in spite of their parents being Valerians. This prompted some to speculate that they had actually been fathered by Sir Harwin Strong, Rhaenyra's champion. This did not change Viserys' mind regarding succession. Lena, Daemon and Rhaenyra decided to withdraw their children. Jaceris would marry Vela, while Viserys would marry her younger twin, Rhaena. The conflict between Alicent and Rhaenyra was inherited by their children, in spite of King Viserys, who hated conflict, doing everything to amend it. Lena, Daemon's wife, died in childbirth, and during her funeral, a quarrel broke out between Alicent's son Aemon and Rhaenyra's sons, after Aemon called them bastards, with Aemon losing his eye in the process. Alicent demanded Luke have an eye removed in response, and Rhaenyra demanded that Aemon be questioned sharply, to learn where he had such rumors. Luckily, none of this happened, and King Viserys announced that anyone who questions the paternity of the Velaryon boys will lose their tongue. Harwin was removed from Rhaenyra's proximity and died in the Great Fire in Harrenhal alongside his father, which prompted Viserys to bring Otto back to court. Later that year, Lainor was killed by his rumored lover, and very shortly after that, Rhaenyra and Daemon secretly married. One of the narrators of Fire and Blood claims that they did so because Rhaenyra was already pregnant. This caused a great scandal since less than a year passed since their previous spouses died and Viserys in particular was livid. Rhaenyra and Daemon had two sons, Aegon and Viserys, who both had Valerian features. When Corlys Velaryon suddenly got ill, the issue of the inheritance of Driftmark arose. Rhaenyra insisted that her second oldest son, Lucerys, should be named as the heir of Driftmark, the seat of House Velaryon, since Jace would inherit the Iron Throne and they were Laenor's closest kin. Other Velaryons protested this, claiming that Luke is a bastard of House Strong. The person who most ardently opposed Luke's inheritance was Corlys' oldest nephew, Vaemond, who ignored that Rhaena and Vela, the daughters of Daemon and Lena, were ahead of him in the line of succession, and claimed that Driftmark should be his. When Vaemond accused Rhaenyra of adultery, Rhaenyra dispatched Daemon to seize him. She later had his head removed and fed his carcass to her dragon Cyrax. All other Velaryons had their tangents cut per Viserys' decree, but after he ordered this, he slipped and cut himself on the throne. Rhaenyra sent her own maester to treat him. Viserys forced the princes and the queen and their families to attend the feast where each woman wore her rival's colors and many displays of goodwill were made, though all of this was just a facade to fool Viserys. When Viserys died, Rhaenyra was on Dragonstone, awaiting the birth of her sixth child. The Greens in King's Landing prevented her from finding out that her father died until they purged the Red Keep of all her supporters and prepared for Aegon's coronation. News of this caused Rhaenyra to go into an early labor and she gave birth to a stillborn daughter, Visenya. Rhaenyra blamed her death on the Greens, claiming that they stole her crown. Some of Rhaenyra's loyalists managed to escape the Red Keep and brought Jaehaerys' crown, worn by Viserys, with them, and Rhaenyra was crowned by Daemon. Later, the Greens offered Rhaenyra peace terms that would confirm her possession of Dragonstone and Luke's inheritance of Driftmark, but she rejected them, telling the envoy, tell my half-brother that I will have my throne, or I will have his head. To gain more support, Rhaenyra sent her sons to treat with various houses of Westeros. Luke was sent to Storm's End, believed to be a safer journey than Jace's venture in the north. However, when Luke arrived there, he encountered Aemon, who chased him on Vega and killed him. The news of Luke's death devastated Rhaenyra, and it was then when the war had truly started. In the show, some key aspects of that journey remain the same, but a lot of it differs significantly. Like in the books, Rhaenyra is the only child of Emma and Viserys who survive infancy. In the show, we meet her when she is about 14 years old. Alison is not a decade her senior, but rather her childhood and seemingly only friend. She is a dragon rider and Viserys' cupbearer. 
When Viserys watches Emma to get a male heir out of her and both of them die, Daemon is heard toasting his dead nephew, calling him heir for a day. This prompts Viserys to disinherit Daemon and name Rhaenyra as his heir, telling her about the Song of Ice and Fire. Rhaenyra is in charge of choosing a new knight to the King's Guard and picks Sir Criston Cole, who proved himself a capable warrior in the tourney held several months back. It turns out that Daemon stole a dragon egg for his paramount Messaria and took residence on Dragonstone, as befits the heir to the throne. Rhaenyra arrives there on Cyrax and confronts him, resolving the situation, though she does not manage to chase Daemon away from Dragonstone. Viserys is initially livid at her acting on her own volition, but eventually acknowledges her success and informs her that he must remarry in spite of their shared grief over Emma, which Rhaenyra accepts. Viserys announces his intention to marry Lady Alison Hightower, Rhaenyra's best friend, which infuriates and disgusts Rhaenyra, who did not know that Otto was sending Alison to console the grieving king. Three years later, Rhaenyra already has one half-brother from the Union, of Alison and Viserys, and another on the way. Rhaenyra fears that Viserys will soon replace her as heir and reluctantly accompanies her family to a royal hunt, celebrating her brother's birthday. Rhaenyra realizes that her father wishes to marry her off, which she does not want, and runs into the woods, with Kristen following her. The two of them spend time together, discussing whether the realm will accept Rhaenyra as the ruling queen of Westeros. As they return to the camp, they witness a white stag, which was pursued by the royal hand, but Rhaenyra lets it live. Rhaenyra eventually does decide to marry and goes on a progress to find a suitor, but is disinterested in the candidates and cuts it short in Storm's End. After returning to the Red Keep, it turns out that Daemon returned from the Stepstones and at night she sneaks out with him, dressed as a boy. Daemon takes Rhaenyra to a brothel, but then suddenly leaves her there. Upon returning, Rhaenyra seduces Sir Criston Cole and loses her virginity to him. Otto Hightower, Alison's father and Hand of the King, who does everything in his power to undermine Rhaenyra, receives news of this outing and informs the King that Daemon and Rhaenyra have been seen in a brothel. Alison overhears this and confronts Rhaenyra, but she vehemently denies the allegations that she had sex with Daemon in the pleasure house. In a way, she neither lies nor does she say the truth, since she did lose her virginity to Criston. In order to avoid a scandal, Viserys orders Rhaenyra to marry Laenor Velaryon to suit the wedge he himself caused by marrying Alicent rather than Lena. She agrees on the condition that he dismisses Otto. Viserys does this and asks Grand Maester Melos to give Munti to Rhaenyra, just in case, and Alicent is informed of this, making her suspicious of Rhaenyra. The royal family arrives at Driftmark, and when the adults discuss the betrothal, Rhaenyra and Laenor, who is gay, privately come to an agreement to perform their duties, but otherwise to have an open marriage. When they are returning to King's Landing, Criston approaches Rhaenyra and, and suggests running away with him to Essos and marrying there. Rhaenyra declines and tells Criston about the deal she struck with Laenor, suggesting that they may continue their relationship secretly. Criston is infuriated at the suggestion, since he believes that he lost his honor by having sex with the princess, and the only way to restore it is to marry her. A vengeful Criston tells Alicent about what happened between him and Rhaenyra. Later and Rhaenyra's wedding feast is shown, and Alicent arrives wearing a green gown, which is supposed to be a declaration of war. Daemon also makes an unannounced entrance into the wedding feast. Lainor's lover Joffrey realizes the truth of the relationship between Rhaenyra and Criston and taunts the latter about it. Just as Viserys sees Daemon and Rhaenyra about to kiss, the wedding gets interrupted by a brawl. Criston beats Joffrey to death and almost commits suicide, but Alicent stops him and extends her protection over him. Lainor and Rhaenyra marry. Ten years later, Rhaenyra gives birth to her third son. Almost immediately after her delivery, Alicent sends a request to see the baby, and Rhaenyra, with Laenor's help, arrives at the Queen's chambers. Alicent and Viserys meet the baby, with Alicent letting Laenor know that she knows they are not his. The child is greeted by Jaceres and Luceres, Rhaenyra's older sons, and Sir Harwin Strong, the commander of the City Watch and the biological father of all three. The princess and the queen continue to clash, but Rhaenyra extends her hand to Alicent, suggesting a betrothal between Alicent's only daughter Helena and her oldest son Jace, which would suit the wedge between the feuding branches. 
After that fails, Rhaenyra grows tired of Alicent scheming and relocates to Dragonstone. Rhaenyra and her family then attend Lena's funeral at Driftmark, making the feuding family branches meet once again. Rhaenyra and Daemon meet at night and have sex. Afterwards, it turns out that the kids started a brawl after Aemon called the Velaryon boys bastards and he lost an eye. When Viserys announces that anyone who questions the paternity of his grandsons is going to have their tanges removed and refuses to punish Luke, Alicent attacks Rhaenyra with Aegon's dagger with an intention to take out Luke's eye as payment for Aemon's. Alicent accuses Rhaenyra of having no sense of duty or sacrifice and always doing what she wants, to which Rhaenyra notes that Alicent's facade finally slipped. Alicent slashes Rhaenyra's arm. Lainor apologizes to Rhaenyra for not being a good husband to her and pledges to change his ways, but Rhaenyra has a different idea. Together with Daemon, they arrange a fake death for Lainor. She then marries Daemon in a Valerian ceremony. Six years later, the succession of Driftmark is put into question by Vaymond, who in the show is Corlys's brother rather than his nephew. In case Luke's claim is challenged, Rhaenyra's and James' claim to the throne would be too. Rhaenys, wife of Corlys, also goes to King's Landing with unknown motivations. While Bela is Rhaenys' ward, she blames Daemon and Rhaenyra for her son's Laenor's death and may side with Alicent's party. Once the Queen's party arrives at King's Landing, they learn that Viserys is so seriously ill that Alicent is his regent. It's implied that the Hightowers and the Maesters are making Viserys' illness worse or are outright its cause. Rhaenyra meets with Rhaenys in the Godswood and suggests a betrothal between Bela and Jace and Luke and Rhaena, which would make Bela the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms and Rhaena to inherit Driftmark. Rhaenys seemingly rejects this offer. At night, Rhaenyra laments the burden she carries as heir to the throne and pleads with her delirious father to defend her. The next day, Waymon presents his claim to Driftmark to Otto and when Rhaenyra is about to speak for Luke, Viserys enters the throne room to take one last stand in defense of her. Rhaenys then decides to back Rhaenyra and agrees to the betrothal, confirming that Corlys always wanted Driftmark to pass to Luke. Waymon snaps, calls Rhaenyra a whore and her children bastards. In response, Daemon kills him. The family shares one last dinner with Viserys, who makes a desperate attempt to mend the wedge between the two branches of the House of the Dragon. Alicent and Rhaenyra forgive each other and express appreciation for one another, with Alicent saying that Rhaenyra will make a fine queen. It seems that the family is finally happy, but the second Viserys leaves, another fight breaks out after Aemond makes an allusion to the paternity of Velaryon boys. Rhaenyra's side of the family returns to Dragonstone and Viserys tells Alicent about the prophecy, mistaking her for Rhaenyra, which makes Alicent believe that he intends for her firstborn, Aegon, to succeed him. Otto stages the queue and Aegon is crowned. Rhaenys arrives at Dragonstone and informs of Viserys' death and the queue, which causes Rhaenyra to go into early labor, delivering a stillborn daughter. During the child's funeral, Eric Cargill arrives with Jaehaerys' crown and pledges his allegiance to Rhaenyra, after which Daemon crowns her. Everyone, aside from Rhaenys, kneels for the rightful queen. During Rhaenyra's first council meeting, she is reminded that while she might not have men, she has dragons, more than the greens. The council is interrupted by the arrival of Otto, there to negotiate peace. He refers to Rhaenyra as princess before she corrects him, calling herself queen, and declares Otto a traitor. He offers Rhaenyra the same terms as Orwell did in the books. Daemon immediately rejects those terms, but Otto insists that Aegon's claim is more legitimate due to Aegon's gender. She takes off the hand spin from Otto's chest, throws it away and once more calls him a traitor. Otto then gives Rhaenyra a page from the book that she and Alicent read as teenagers, with Rhaenyra getting teary-eyed. Daemon wants to kill the negotiators, but Rhaenyra overrules and says she will consider the terms. Rhaenyra is reluctant to use dragons in war and believes that she has to hold the realm together rather than tear it apart. Daemon rebacks this, stating that the Greens have already declared war and raises his opposition to Rhaenyra's inaction. Rhaenyra and Daemon talk privately and Daemon chokes her, enraged. The next day, Corlys arrives at Dragonstone, pledging himself to Rhaenyra's cause after he was convinced to do so by Rhaenys. Rhaenyra sends her sons as envoys to secure the allegiance of House Arryn, Stark and Baratheon. Luke is believed to be on the safer journey in Storm's End, but he gets accidentally killed by Aemond. Daemon informs Rhaenyra of this and she is furious. 
Comparing both of the versions of events, we see the following changes. 1. In the books, Rhaenyra is named as heir at age 8. In the show, she is named as heir at age 14, and Viserys seemingly only does this to punish Daemon. 2. In the books, Lena is her best friend and they betrothed their children when they were toddlers. In the show, the relationship was cut in order to create a friendship with Alicent. This makes her far more isolated and distant from Rhaenys and Corlys. The children are betrothed much later. 3. In the books, she is supported by the princess's party, has numerous ladies in waiting and other female companions. In the show, she has very little support at court. 4. In the books, Kristen becomes her sworn shield when she is 7 and he is 23, with even Alicent making a comment about this disturbing dynamic. In the show, they are closer in age, though he still meets her when he is in his early 20s and she is 14, it's Rhaenyra who pursues a relationship with him, and some even claim that, due to power imbalance, she raped him. 5. In the books, Rhaenyra blames the Greens for the death of Visenya and promises to avenge her. In the show, she does not. 6. In the books, Rhaenyra is eager to go to war for what she sees as her birthright. In the show, she briefly considers giving the throne up and is reluctant to go to war until Luke's death. 7. In the books, she rejects the peace terms. In the show, she considers them. 8. In the books, she is proud, stubborn, quick to anger. In the show, she is much more toned down. The change seen in Rhaenyra's character is a symptom of a wider pattern in how all of House of the Dragon writes its female characters. This change is most apparent with the character of Alicent Hightower, who was rendered into a pawn of her ambitious father, rather than the driving force behind the Dance of the Dragons. However, in the case of Rhaenyra, it is slightly more subtle. Outwardly, Rhaenyra might resemble her book counterpart, and it took me a direct scene-to-scene -scene comparison to truly realize just how profoundly Rhaenyra was changed. Fundamentally, this change has the same underlying reason as the change done to Alicent. We get references to the Dance of the Dragons already in A Game of Thrones, but the actual story was presented to us in The Princess and the Queen, or The Blacks and the Greens, written as an in-universe history book by Archmaester Gildane. This story is once more recounted in The World of Ice and Fire, a compendium about the entire world created by Martin as supplementary material to his lore, also written as an in-universe history book. The third and thus far the most detailed installment of this story is presented in Fire and Blood, where the new narrators add their own interpretation of events and the story is expanded. These days, one must only read Fire and Blood to get the full picture of not only Rhaenyra's story, but also what came before and after her. Nonetheless, the fact that the first time the Dance of the Dragons was described was in The Princess and the Queen is significant, since already the title positions Rhaenyra and Alicent as the main characters of these events, Rhaenyra, the princess, as the protagonist, and Alicent, the queen, as the antagonist. The factions named themselves after the dresses Alicent and Rhaenyra wore at a tournament, and before that event, court spoke of Queen's party and the Princess's party. That does not mean that Alicent and Rhaenyra are the only agents in the story. The Hand and the Prince also had their roles to play, but the story is centered around these two dangerous women. In the show, the mastermind of the entire scheme to put Aegon on the throne is Otto, appropriating all of Alicent's iconic lines and actions and reducing her to his pawn, who forever remains mentally a teenager, even as a woman pushing 40. I made a separate video about her, so I recommend watching it. Does the same development happen to Rhaenyra, only in her case, the agent of all the actions is Daemon? To some degree, yes, especially in episode 10, but one problem that we encounter is that Otto is present in Alicent's proximity practically all the time, while Daemon spends a significant portion of his screen time away from King's Landing. He only truly returns to the game in episode 7, having spent at least 10 years away from Rhaenyra. So whose party formed at court after Daemon's departure? The party of the Hand and... 
No party. No second party formed at court. The Greens and the Blacks were simply not introduced. Alison does have her grand entrance in the green dress, but the reason why she chooses to declare war is because her now estranged former best friend lied to her about having premarital sex and only the actress's comments and the release of the script for episode 1 revealed that it's also because she has a crush on Kristen. But also she's in love with Renira, so who knows. In the show proper, without this info in mind, it's quite bizarre and exacerbated by the fact that there was never an equivalent scene for Rhaenyra. In fact, she only starts wearing black in episode 7. That is because Rhaenyra has no relationships or allies at court that could call themselves the Blacks or the Queen's party. She is not friends with Lena, so the support of Rhaenys and Corlys is out of the question until episode 10. She distances herself from Alicent and the friendship is further ruined after the war declaration. While she and Lenor seem close even in spite of their lack of compatibility, we are shown that she cannot really rely on him and that he is irresponsible. She does not seem to have close relationships with her ladies-in-waiting. Her relationship with Criston ends quickly even before he has a chance to join the non-existent black faction. We are barely shown any interactions between her and Harwin before he is quickly sent away and dies. We do see Harold Westerling interact with her in the first episodes and he leaves the Green Council to protest her usurpation and Lord Bisbury is speaking for her, but otherwise Rhaenyra is the one thing she should not be. Isolated and weak. She cannot handle court politics on her own, she cannot find allies, she has to rely on Viserys and Daemon for help in managing the growing divide. I have been alone. You abandoned me. And look at what my life became without you. Once she marries Daemon, Rhaenyra is completely dependent on him. Rhaenyra underwent the same change as Alicent. She stopped being the protagonist of her own story, just like Alicent stopped being the antagonist, and these roles were given to Otto and Daemon. What is even worse, her protagonist status is so greatly diminished that, as a character, she practically exists as an extension of others when it should be the other way around. Alice and Otto and Damon should exist for her, not the other way around. Like with Alice and, from episode 7 onwards, a lot of Rhaenyra's actions were given to Damon, and everything else she does is significantly toned down. In episode 8, when Damon makes his petition, Damon acts on his own volition when he kills him and his body is left intact. While the matter of Cyrax eating his corpse can be plausible denied by budgetary constraints, Rhaenyra's inaction during this scene cannot. Similarly, the things she does in episode 10, where her change from the source material becomes the most apparent, cannot be explained by anything but the ideas the showrunners have about women, women in power, and the nature of the story that is the Dance of the Dragons. Rhaenyra does go into early labor in both instances, but how she reacts to it is drastically different. In the books, Rhaenyra shrieks curses at the greens and details the torments she will put them through. While in the show she says very little, only yelling get out, get out, before the child is delivered stillborn. There are no accusations directed towards the greens and neither is there the promise of revenge. What is even more, Miguel Saposhnik, the former showrunner, had this to say about this scene. Suddenly, the thing she's been fighting for, her birthright, is being taken away from her and she has to be that baby-making machine she was always scared of. She's desperate not to miss it, so she wills it out of her. That's not how it works, Miguel. You can't will a baby out of yourself. Notice that the blame for the miscarriage goes not to the Greens, whose actions caused Rhaenyra feelings so strong that it induced early labor something that does happen in real life as well, but to Rhaenyra herself. She is accused by Saposhnik of killing her own baby just to be able to participate in war councils and not be a baby machine. These words also go against what Rhaenyra says and does in this scene. First, she removes herself from this situation entirely. When Jace asks where Daemon went, she says, I don't know, gone to madness gone to plot his war. <laughs> and later gives Jace command that nothing is to be done without her leave. Which is not the best move either. 
Damon has experience in war and they work on a time constraint, so delegating him to do initial preparations is the only logical move in this situation and does not take away from her being the highest authority in this situation. This would be the same if she was sick or away from Dragonstone. Moreover, why is Rhaenyra only now thinking of herself as a baby-making machine? She gave birth to five children before. Another instance of Rhaenyra acting like the opposite of her book self is the bridge scene during negotiations between herself and Otto. Notice how it's Daemon who does most of the talking and Rhaenyra's iconic lines from the book are absent as well. She does call them traitors, but makes no threats to Aegon. The final blow to her characterization appears when she gets teary-eyed at the memory of her old childhood friend, who has been her mortal enemy for 10 years now, and with whom she only very recently reconciled, and who now threw that reconciliation out of the window. Even after the usurpation that caused her to miscarry, Rhaenyra is still crying at the long-ended friendship. This only cements what I said before. Rhaenyra is reduced to being an extension of other characters. A side note I have to all this is that I think the best way to illustrate my assertion is by pointing out that show Rhaenyra is closer to book Dani in personality, while book Rhaenyra is closer to show Dani in personality. Book Dani often ponders the ramification of using dragons in warfare. Book Dani would like to give up the throne to lead a simple life instead. Show Dani, on the other hand, never once thinks of these ramifications and is single-mindedly fixated on reclaiming the throne, seen as her birthright. Just like Book Rhaenyra. <laughs> The idea to narrate this story in the form of a history book is an interesting choice, especially when the sources that recount these events often contradict each other. Fans need to investigate themselves to get the most likely version of events, and even then some question marks will remain, and even then we still need to remember that the people who write it have their own agendas at play. It's exactly how it is with real history. It's a cool experiment, a fresh narrative choice, but that narrative choice was, unfortunately, wasted on a fandom that does not possess enough intelligence or critical thinking skills to appreciate it and understand all the implications of it. And neither do the showrunners. George R. R. Martin said that, had he been 30 years younger, he would gladly write the dance in the POV manner like the main series. And perhaps he should have, given that the nature of this story is not used to speculate and investigate, but to make up whatever version of events is the most convenient for one's agenda. So while Mushroom is considered to be a bawdy gossip girl and his claims are always questioned, all of a sudden everyone wants Sarah Snow to be real, even though she was clearly made up by him. Just as often it means ignoring things that are not put into question by any of the narrators of this story. Now we have claims that Book Alicent was also a victim with no agency, that we can't be sure whether Aemond really wanted to kill Luke, that Daemon simply teleported from the Stepstones to kill Rhea, and then teleported back, with everyone at the scene hallucinating her having a riding accident. It seems like nobody understands that twisting the events so significantly makes the entire book worthless. Why should we listen to the historians if they are so inept that they can't recant character ages properly or mess up their family trees. The way the dance should have been adapted is by carefully examining the narratives and choosing the most probable course of events. HBO is rich and the budget for House of the Dragon was huge. Why not employ actual historians who have experience in decoding historical documents? And even some more obscure details of the story could easily be left up to interpretation. What happened instead was the showrunners essentially writing a fanfic where key elements of the story were changed and switched around to fit their preferred narrative. And that narrative is to balance the story out and give a lot of positive traits to the greens while taking away from the blacks. The showrunners piggybacked off of someone else's story, completely disregarding the message it sends. And rather than be called out by fans, they are exonerated and the plausible deniability they themselves use it's an unreliable history book, is thrown even at things that were never put into question, or that simply did not happen. In the book, nobody puts Alison's age into question or gives a different account of her relationship to Rhaenyra, 
We know for sure that she was 10 years older and that they got along well before Alison gave birth to sons. Munkon does not say that, per some documents, Alison's birth year was different or something, not even as a footnote. We know for sure that the source of their conflict was their opposing ambitions, not the fact that one lied to another about having sex with her crush. We know for sure that Alison was the leading agent of the king-making machinations and that she was the one ordering Otto around. None of this is ever questioned. Yet both Alison and Rhaenyra underwent a similar change. Because the showrunners projected their own bigotry onto them. And that is, undoubtedly, sexism. But not just a hostile one. A benevolent one. To call sexism benevolent may come across as puzzling. When thinking of it, we usually envision something that is the opposite of benevolent. Things like pay gap, devaluation of women's work, or in extreme cases, even femicide and rape. What is benevolent sexism then? Recent developments in feminist theory emphasize the distinction between hostile and benevolent sexism. Hostile sexism refers to negative stereotypes about gender, for example that women are less intelligent or capable than men. Benevolent sexism, on the other hand, refers to seemingly positive gender stereotypes, for example that women are inherently better at understanding emotions or better at taking care of children. These seem to be positive, even praiseworthy characteristics, so why would we even be bothered by them? That is because, even if they seem positive, they cement women's subjugation and affirm their societal roles, as well as their subservience towards men. Gender roles expect women to take a nurturing role both in their relations with men and children. Have you ever heard the proverb that the wife is the neck while the man is the head? That means that the woman exists to support her husband, existing subordinately to him. The idea that women are simply better at dealing with emotions affirms this assertion, that she's there to work out his feelings for him while he deals with serious business. The idea that women are better at taking care of children works in much the same way. With this assertion in mind, the onus of raising children disproportionately falls on women, and they are not compensated for it in any way and are not expected to ask to be, as this is believed to be almost biological duty of theirs. What makes benevolent sexism so hard to combat is that, in many cases, it's difficult to perceive or may even make women feel good. When a woman is said to be stupider than her male co-workers because she is a woman, she is not going to feel good. But when she hears that stupid men do not understand emotions and only women have this sacred knowledge, she may be inclined to agree and feel good about having a skill men do not possess. The showrunners are benevolently sexist towards Rhaenyra. Daemon and Rhaenyra are positioned in the opposite sides of the spectrum, with Daemon as the active one and Rhaenyra as, as the passive one. Men cause wars while women try to prevent them. There is a scene in the Green Council where Alison says, We do not rule, but we may guide the men that do. Gently, away from violence and sure destruction and instead toward peace. And is tributed by Rainus. And yet you toil still in service to men. Your father, your husband, your son. You desire not to be free, but to make a window in the wall of your prison. Except this tributal means very little if the show literally ends validating Alison's words. We do not rule, but we may guide the men that do. Gently, away from violence and sure destruction and instead toward peace. Gone to madness. Gone to plot his war. Are you not angry? Why well, I should declare war because I'm angry. No, because it's your duty as queen to crush rebellion. Queen Alison eagerly awaits your answer. She could have her answer now, stuffed in her father's mouth along with his withered cock. Let's end this mama's farm. <laughs> Sir Eric, bring me Lord Hightower so I may take the pleasure myself. No. Trying to prevent a war is positive on the surface. But once we look at this deeper, you see that the showrunners believe that women are inherently less capable of violence and cruelty, and are more thoughtful of what war entails than their impulsive men. 
War is not a thing women engage in. It's reserved for men. Women would, of course, never wish harm on anyone. Women are the source of moral goodness in this world. As such, her subservient role is once again reaffirmed, and should she ever stray from this role, there is no point of return for her, as Foz Meadows argues in a famous essay. Women aren't allowed to be broken by the world. Or if we are, it's the breaking that makes us villains. Wronged women turn into avenging furies, inhuman and monstrous. Once we cross to the dark side, we become adversaries to be defeated, not lost souls in need of mending. Which is what happens when you let benevolent sexism invest you in the idea that women are humanity's moral guardians and men its native renegades. Because if female goodness is only ever an inherent quality, something we're born both with and to be, then once lost, it must necessarily be lost forever. A severed limb we can't regrow. This is already quite sinister, but the reasons for the alteration in Rhaenyra's character go even deeper and have even more disturbing implications. One of the sources that is used to narrate the dance is the testimony of Grandmaster Orwell, who witnessed the dance and sat on the Green Council. His testimony is not 100% reliable because he tried to whitewash himself. In the books, it is Orwell who is sent to the initial round of negotiations and reports that Rhaenyra said, tell my half-brother that I will have my throne or I will have his head. Orwell has no reason to lie about what Rhaenyra said here, especially since she also tells the envoys to give this message to Egan. Orwell would have only lied about how he reacted to Rhaenyra, not to what she said. But Orwell isn't the only source, and indeed, we might argue to what extent the narrators of Fire and Blood try to demonize Rhaenyra, but there are things we cannot deny. 1. We do not know Rhaenyra outside of Fire and Blood. And 2. Her behavior in Fire and Blood is consistent with George's comments about her. So as far as we're concerned, this is her canon personality. Proud, stubborn, quick to anger, never forgets a slight. As far as we're concerned, she did tell Orwell that she will take Egon's head. So why is Rhaenyra not at all similar to her book counterpart, and why did the showrunners fall into the pattern of benevolent sexism in the first place? The Dance of the Dragons as a narrative was, in a way, ahead of its time. It was definitely ahead of its time for a fandom filled with alt-right insults and various flavors of misogynistic reactionaries, from regular centrist redditors to outwardly progressive Tumblr meta-writers. This narrative is ahead of its time because Canon Rhaenyra is, by no means, a palatable character, especially to the audience that glorifies traditional, feudal, gentle and soft femininity. While Book Rhaenyra is very feminine in her presentation, something that the show also altered, which is perhaps a subject for another video, her personality is far from a quiet martyr who always does her duty and sacrifice, like Rayella or Nairis. She is proud, she acts irrationally, and does things that put her in an unsympathetic light. She is at times cruel and selfish. At the same time, her life is a string of tragedies, and the source of these tragedies is solely her gender, with these tragedies culminating in her being a victim of femicide so horrific that witnesses gouge their eyes out. So, this narrative presents the following dilemmas to the reader. This woman does not have the most palatable personality. She might even come across as unlikable. She makes mistakes and is imperfect. She grows paranoid and resentful. She acts cruelly. She herself is far from a feminist. Yet nonetheless, the success of her cause directly correlates with social progress. Are you still capable of finding it within yourself to feel sympathetic for her? Do her flaws make you apathetic to her ultimate fate? Do you think that her ultimate fate is an appropriate punishment for these mistakes? Do you think that misogyny is only bad when it affects those who are seen as proper women and good victims? What is the answer that the vast majority of the fandom gives? No, we are not capable of finding it within ourselves to feel sympathetic for her. Yes, her flaws do make us apathetic to her fate. Yes, we think that her ultimate fate is an appropriate punishment for these mistakes. Yes, we think that misogyny is only bad when it's against those we see as proper, good victims. Enlightened centrist will say that she brought it upon herself, that both the greens and the blacks sucked, that she should have accepted that she never had a chance. 
Outright insults will call her a fat whore who got what she deserved for spreading her legs and wanting a throne that belongs to a man. Progressive intersectional Marxist feminists will call her a Margaret Thatcher figure, repeat the mantra of her not being a feminist, even though nobody claims that, mock her as a stupid girl boss and claim that they can back her clearly progressive cause because she's not literally perfect. All of them are apathetic to the violent misogyny she is subjected to, the misogyny that eventually kills her children and then her own self. Perhaps the most insidious of it all are the self-proclaimed progressives, for whom misogyny only matters when it's against certain women and who affirm that some women are acceptable targets of it. This way they believe that misogyny is justifiable, that you can do something to deserve it and that it may be an appropriate punishment. In a way, this precedent was already set with Cersei. The narrative asks the same questions about her. Cersei was raped and abused by Robert. Do you think she deserved it because she's evil? Do you think that abuse is an acceptable punishment for evil women? Most people say yes and yes, it's good that Robert slapped his cunt wife around. Most people think that Cersei's clearly misogynistic humiliation in the walk of shame was deserved and cheered at it. Most people think that the best way for her to receive an ultimate punishment is via femicide. For whatever faults Rhaenyra has, she is not Cersei. She does not kill and abuse beloved characters. But even in that case, the logic is exactly the same. What's the point of this rant? That the showrunners think so too. And that this affected the way Rhaenyra was written. They knew that had Rhaenyra been adapted properly, that if she was ruthless even before the war started, she would not be so widely liked as a character. This is why they toned her down, made her insecure and isolated, made her always be the party asking for peace, made Daemon the agent of all the questionable actions she took in the books. All to make her more palatable. But the problem is, this did not necessarily work as intended. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is a subject of mockery, ire and disgust by a large portion of the fandom. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is called a spoiled brat. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is said to have killed Vaemond, even though she literally just stood there and did nothing. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is called a whore and a slut. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is called a rapist. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is considered an idiot for thinking she ever had a chance. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is expected to give up her claim and be the bigger person. Even the toned-down Rhaenyra is called a Margaret Thatcher and a stupid girl boss. They change this character for nothing. They change this character because they fully believe that this is the only way to make her sympathetic in the audience's eyes and it did not even work. What does it say about this society that we live in that even a toned-down, palatable, by all means likable Rhaenyra still gets so little sympathy for the misogynistic violence unleashed against her? That perhaps toning her down would never work? That perhaps instead we should fight for her true self to be preserved and confront the audience with these questions once more? Maybe even point our finger at them. Emma Darcy, the actor who portrays older Rhaenyra, did say in a recent interview that the Rhaenyra who tries to keep peace is gone. But why is she gone only now? Why wasn't she gone the moment she miscarried because of the news of her usurpation? It's definitely because the show does not place the blame for Visenya's death on the greens and the narrative itself does not seem to register it as such. Per Sapochnik's words, she causes the death herself, explicitly refuses the help of her midwives, wills it out of herself, so that she can attend war council. What makes a point of no return is Luke's death. Per the actor's words, Rhaenyra only truly commits to the war after the death of her child. That too is there to make her more palatable to the general audience, because what is the most acceptable motivation for women? Children, of course. We see the same with Alicent, who only decides to go with Otto's plans because he convinces her that her children are not safe if Rhaenyra is crowned. The only thing that allows Rhaenyra to go full fire and blood is her child's death, the only acceptable reason she could have. If it was I will have my throne, then she would be out of her role as a woman. Because women are not supposed to be ambitious, but nurturing. Women are supposed to prevent wars and not start them, right? And honestly, I am not inclined to believe Emma Darcy's words, since the actors, the script and showrunners are never in agreement with one another. 
Ryan Condal says that there is a possibility of reconciliation between Alicent and Rhaenyra, even after Luke's death. Darcy says it's all fire and blood now. The script for season 1 was so inconsistent that I am not inclined to believe that this will, indeed, be their course of action. I suppose time will tell, but I don't have a lot of hope. The reasons for the character assassination of Rhaenyra Targaryen are twofold, benevolent sexism and the wish to make her more palatable as a protagonist. It did not work as intended, as there are still those who resent her on misogynistic grounds. What is more, not only did it make Rhaenyra inconsistent, but she is no longer Rhaenyra. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video.